19, verse 1 through 7. And I want to tell you, uh, I'm so thankful for your attendance. I'm thankful what God's doing in our church. And uh, we just praise the Lord for it. And um, let's have a good service, all right? Amen. So Acts 19, we pick it up in verse 1 through 7. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask God to bless us. Father, thank you so much for this time, and thank you, Lord, for your word. And Father, we're thankful that uh, it's the eternal word of God. And Father, it doesn't change, it, it doesn't, uh, uh, it, it convicts, it converts, it, it does a great work, it's a comfort. And Father, we pray that you do all these things today in our service and I pray, Father, you deal with people's hearts who have never been born again. And, Father, people who are saved, we pray, Lord, the ministry of the Spirit of God would be in their lives. And, Father, we want to tell you that today we need you. We cannot do this without you. It's impossible. And, Father, we ask that you bless in a great way and speak to our hearts. And, Father, have your will in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice chapter 19 of Acts, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, finding certain disciples. And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto then unto what then were you baptized and they said unto john's baptism then said paul john verily baptized with the baptism of repentance saying unto the people that they should believe on him uh, which they uh, should come after him that is on christ verse 5 when they heard this they were baptized in the name of Lord Jesus, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came uh, came upon them, and uh, they had spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the, all the men were, were about twelve, uh, and uh, they uh, I'm sorry. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, and disputing and persuading things concerning the kingdom of God. Thank you. you. may be seated. So this is really an interesting text. A lot of people don't understand what Paul was speaking about here. Some people say they need to be baptized. Uh, some people said, no, they, they had baptism, but they needed something else. They needed a, a confirmation from, from the Lord and so on. But Paul... Uh, is on the third missionary journey, and we see that in Acts 18, the space of verse three months, and disputing and, and persuading says, them things concerning well, the kingdom uh, of God. Uh, Thank you, may be seated. Keep the feast so to Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed into Ephesus, and when they had landed in Caesarea, and gave uh, and gone up, and salute, and salute church, and went down to Antioch. And then the Bible says in verse 23, and after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phygia in order to strengthen all the disciples. So we see Paul in 24, 28, the conversion of Quill and Priscilla, and in verse 26, they taught Apollos the way of God more perfectly. I believe that Aquila and Priscilla uh, taught Apollos about the New Testament church. He was a man who preached the gospel, and, uh, but he didn't understand the, the working of God's New Testament church and the importance of joining one and being on the authority of a good church. And there's a great truth to that, that people don't understand the New Testament church and the blessing that we have being a member of Long Island Baptist or other 
independent Baptist churches. Uh, it's such a, 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 there's so many benefits uh, from belonging to a New Testament church. So we, we find here, um, in uh, notice the next place, we see Apollos in Acts 19, verse 1, in Corinth. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, we see Apollos was involved uh, for a while in the church at Corinth, and later Paul asked Titus to send Apollos to him. So in chapter 19 of Acts, we find Paul going into the city of Ephesus, and the Bible says uh, Paul found, uh, excuse me, uh, certain disciples, and disciple mean learner. Now, this is important because you have, to, you have to think as you go into chapter 19, this is not talking about disciples of Christ, they're certain learners. And uh, Paul uh, states that very plainly. So we, we see in, um, in the Bible tells uh, of men and movements that they had disciples or learners of them. For example, Moses had disciples. John the Baptist had disciples. Jesus had disciples. And one of the disciples was Judas Iscariot. So although the Bible calls them disciples, they were learners. And they, they were learning about the Lord Jesus, and uh, there were other things that uh, took place with certain disciples. Pharisees had disciples. And Jesus, in John chapter 6, had disciples who the Bible says walk no more with him. Very important. They walk no more with him. And yet, from chapter 6 of John to chapter 8, the Bible says, we'll know that you're a disciple if you continue in his word. And that's the key. We continue in his word. So here is a, a passage of scripture. We see 12 men uh, in the Bible called learners or disciples. But the text does not tell us exactly who they were learning from or what they were learning about. And uh, what we, we, uh, all we know is that uh, they claim to know John's baptism. Now, personally, they weren't around when John baptized. It was in fact, 50 years later, uh, when Acts 19 was penned down. And apparently they heard of John's baptism from someone else, uh, but whosoever they heard it from did not tell the truth about the message of John the Baptist preached. Now, I remember years ago, uh, talking to Nathaniel Hazard, and he told me about William Carey, that he had his baptism. And he said that his baptism was what saved him. Now, William Carey didn't believe that. But down through the years, people per pervert things. And that teaching was perverted. He wasn't claiming the new birth. He was claiming new birth through baptism. So we had to get that straightened out with uh, Brother Nathaniel and... Uh, He's been a good disciple since, amen? <laughs> so apparently they heard of John's baptism and very possibly they were disciples of Apollos. His message was supposedly the same as John the Baptist's message. Let's turn to chapter 18 and notice verse 25. And we see what the Bible uh, says, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. So uh, uh, it could have been Apollos' disciples. We don't know. Now let's focus on what, what we do know and Paul's question and response from these disciples. And I, I think we will find out that these, uh, these men were not true converts, of Christ till they, they understood what Paul was saying. So let's, let's begin. Uh, first of all, the question is asked, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And those verse two, the Bible says, uh, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, we were not uh, so much as heard whether 
there was any Holy Ghost. Now, the first look here at the a part of the Holy Ghost plays in salvation. So in John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of, kingdom of God. And then he goes on and says, That was born of flesh of flesh, that was born of spirit of spirit, marvel not thy sin, ye must be born of God, uh, be born again. So the water uh, represents uh, the birth, uh, uh, physical birth, and when the woman's water breaks, and the spirit speaks about the Holy Spirit. And a person could not get saved unless the Holy Spirit is present and active in dealing with that person's soul. So it's really interesting when you listen to someone's testimony, tell me what brought you to Christ or what happened or how'd you come to Christ. These are very interesting thoughts. And you know, you, you want to find out what they went through. And lots of times people say, I, you know, I started thinking about death or, you know, uh, you know, I need a change in my life, etc. Now, the Father used the Spirit to convict men that he is being uh, said is true. In John 6, verse 44, no man can come to me except the Father hath drawn him. The Holy, Holy Spirit and uh, the people resist. And we find here in Acts chapter 7, verse 51, he stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your father did, so do ye. And then in verse 54, when they heard the, these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. I mean, think of that. I mean, someone gnawing on you with their teeth. And then the Holy Spirit draws and and people receive. We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 41. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and sent unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That was a question mark. And uh, they, they didn't understand uh, what they should do. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So three words of acts of the Holy Spirit. Number one is the Holy Spirit will illuminate you. He illuminates the unbeliever. So you know this to be true if you're saved uh, or maybe you're not saved and you're starting to understand the Bible. You know, there's, a, there's an illumination that takes place. Why? Because man by nature is in darkness. Man is separated from God. Man, man is ignorant. Of the Word of God, man is he's blind. He can't see. His mind is blind. So there's illumination to the unbeliever, and then he draws the unbeliever, and that's very important. The Spirit of God will draw him, and uh, in other words, he'll convict him. He'll show him that Christ is the only way. There's no other way to be saved but through Jesus Christ. And then they also convict the unbeliever. And what does he convict him over? His sin. That's so important. You know, people are separated from God. Why? Because of sin. Iniquity. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, let's look at uh, the work of regeneration or salvation. Uh, the unbeliever becomes a believer. In John chapter 1, verse 11... He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So Jesus went to the Jews first, and they didn't receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now here's the key, which are born, not of blood. You're not going to get to heaven because your relative is saved. You've got to personally receive Christ. It's not by blood, nor the will of the flesh. You can't will yourself to be saved. You can't say, well, I'm going to be saved. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to make it happen. You're going to make it happen when the Spirit of God's dealing with your heart. Right? So it's not up to you. It's up to God. And I'm not saying that God won't save you. But I'm saying it's got to be a combination of 
you know, your desire, whosoever will, and the Spirit of God. And nor the will of man, but of God. So that was, uh, was born not of blood. In other words, salvation is a personal uh, a deal. You, you, you aren't saved because your parents were saved or your spouse is saved. It's personal salvation. Now notice back here in Matthew chapter 3, please. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. And the Bible says in verse 7, And then he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, and he sent them, O generation of vipers, or O generation of snakes, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And the Bible says in verse 9, And Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say unto you that God's able these stones to raise up children of Abraham. So John was very confrontational in dealing with these the religious crowd. And he, he told them, and he called them snakes. And uh, he, he said, I warned you in, uh, to flee from the wrath to come. And then he, he puts on them, the teaching of fruit from repentance. So repentance is essential. You can't be saved. Jesus said, With, uh, except you repent, you all likewise perish. So that's very important. And then the Bible says, was born uh, not of the will of flesh. Ephesians 2, 8, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. You can't work for a gift, you can't earn a gift. Uh, uh, it's a gift of God, not of uh, works, works as, uh, not of works as, let's let him answer both. So the Bible tells us in this one verse uh, that a man, whether it's myself or any other man, uh, has no power to save you uh, or help you, help to save you. And then he goes on and says in ver letter D, which were born of God. So let's go back to Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter 2. All right, and notice verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where, uh, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of that worketh in children of disobedience. So before you were saved, you followed the devil. That's what, that's what he's saying here, the course of this world. And uh, so he, he goes on and calls them, uh, who worketh the children of, of disobedience, among whom also we all had our uh, conversation, our lifestyle in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So Paul is writing here to the church of Ephesus, and he's talking about our past. He says in verse 1, he's in you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Then he said in verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love where he loved us, even while we are dead in sins, had quickened us together in Christ, for a grace are you saved. So it's so important that we understand we're saved by the grace of God. And then it can't be by works, because grace and work can't, can't mix. You're either saved by works or you're saved by grace. Then notice chapter 1 of Ephesians, and the Bible says it's in verse 13, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after you believed you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So you have to hear the word, you have to believe the word, you have to trust the word, and then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that's life changing. That's what changed our lives from dead works to serve the living God. The Spirit of God does the work, the spiritual work. And then we see regeneration. Now, second of all, we see evidence of the Holy Spirit work in a life. 
Uh, if you are truly saved, you will not have you you will not only have the knowledge of it, but you will see the Holy Spirit working in our life. And this is essential, beloved. It's so important. You know, the Bible says in the parable of the sower, you have to be honest when you come to Christ. So may I say there's a lot of people who are dishonest when they come to the Lord. They're not really dealing with things. Remember that parable that God says they, he dug deep, talking about the rock and, you know, build a foundation. He dug deep. Well, a lot of people won't dig deep. There's too much junk to see. And they'd rather not deal with it. But it's important that we deal with things. So let's get into this. Uh, here are some key evidences. First of all, we see assurance. Now let's go to 1 John chapter 5. And notice, if you would, verse 11. 1 John 5, verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in the Son. Real simple. It's not in anything else but Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not anyone else but Jesus Christ. Verse 12, he that hath the Son hath what? Life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not. Life. And then these things have been written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Now, beloved, I want to ask you something. Gun battle straight. Do you know? Do you know you're saved? Do you know your sins are forgiven? Do you know you're going to heaven when you die? Well, I hope I did. No, no, no. I didn't ask that. I'm asking you straight out. Do you know that you're a child of God? Well, I've lived in a Christian life all my life. I didn't ask that. I'm not interested in that. I want to know, did you have a, an experience in your life when you turn from self and sin to Christ, you've got to be honest. Amen. You know, with, a, with an honest heart. And you say, well, the heart's depraved. I get all that. But you've got to be honest when you come to Christ. So it's so important that uh, we, we are honest with ourselves. Amen. And then 1 John chapter 4, please, and verse 13 Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So notice, we are in him and, and he in us. Why? What, 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 what tells us? Because he hath given us of his spirit. Now I want to talk to you. Now let's, let's just be very plain. I really believe with all my heart that there are people that are attend our church, they were considered church members. And uh, when it comes down to preaching on the Spirit and these things, you really struggle. I'm not your enemy. I'm telling you, you really struggle. And why do you struggle? Because you haven't experienced that. You haven't, you, you don't know. It's so important that you know you try to talk yourself into it, but you can't. When you're saved, you cannot deny what God did in your life. Now, I'm not talking about reformation. I'm talking about regeneration. Grace is so good to see you this morning. Welcome back. Um, it's so important that we experience regeneration, a new life. And I think there's a lot of people they haven't dug deep. It's bottom line. They haven't looked at themselves. And there's too much to uncover. And that's why you're sitting here lost this morning. Now notice you would, chapter 3, verse 24, 1 John. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he has given to us. So how do we know? Because we keep his commandments. And you don't have to keep his commandments to be saved. But a result of you being saved, you're going to keep God's commandments. And they're not grievous. It's not hard. I've got to keep his commandments. What are you talking about? You're talking about God. You're talking about the Bible. You're talking about the Lord. 
It's not hard. Then we see not only the assurance, but the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, let's turn there, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And notice um, verse 11. The Bible says, verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man, and uh, which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. So uh, let me just explain that. Man has a spirit about him. You can say, oh, uh, he has a funny spirit, or he's a strong spirit, you know, different personalities. But the Bible tells us here, uh, in the second part of that verse, uh, he says, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Uh, he says the same thing in verse 11, uh, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. And then verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but that which the Holy Ghost uh, teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. And then he said in verse 14, but the natural man, that's the unsaved man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness on them. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. It goes on in verse 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, uh, that he may instruct him, uh, but we have the mind of Christ. So again, it speaks about the Holy Spirit, and we, we have the mind of Christ as far as uh, believing and being saved. Now notice John 16, please. John 16 and verse 13. In verse 13, the Bible says, I'm sorry, here we are. Verse 16, the Bible says, Very, verily I say to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that uh, is, is sent greater than him that sent him. So uh, if you know these things, happy are uh, if you do them. So God tells us very plainly in his word that the Holy Spirit always leads according to the Bible, never contrary to it. And so you've got to be very careful in your life what you say that God has led you to do or what God is doing. Make sure it's sound. Make sure it's according to the word of God. The Holy Spirit always leads a child of God to be scriptural and baptized into a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching Bible practicing Baptist church. Now, what is the guideline in making decisions in your life? Your knowledge, your past, your, your college, uh, your wisdom, uh, uh, the preach on the radio, family members or unsaved friends. You know, we should seek the leadership of the Spirit of God in our lives and look to the blessed Word of God. And if, if you do not always seek wisdom and counsel uh, of your pastor, uh, you know, it's, it's your loss. And I, I say with all sincerity, I'm not asking you to come see me going to buy a car. Come on. Look, you know, you can look for the catalog somewhere, magazine, a good, the best car out there, whatever. But I, when you're making life decisions, it should come see me first. A lot of people don't. They tell me what they're doing. So I say, you know, be warm, be filled. <laughs> what do you want me to do? I'm going to stay in the road and stop you. You see, there's a difference. Amen. Amen. And so we, we find that I can 
until a person is saved quickly by their speech, their thoughts on the subject, matter of fact, by the very spirit uh, about them. And people try to mimic Christianity in their talk, in their walk, in their actions. But they only go so far in the false Christianity because they do not have the gift of the Spirit of God. They don't know that they're converted to Christ and the Spirit of God's living within, work in their lives. They only have the unregenerate, unsaved spirit. And they all they can uh, really look to is that I'm a church member at Law and Baptist. And I appreciate that. But you want to have a different life. You want to have a deeper life. You want to know the Lord. Amen. I, I mean that with all my heart. Now there's some people, and I'm not going to pick on these two men, but some people say amen to that. But they're not even converted. And how do you know that? You just tell. It's very important. Now, my friend, you can try until you're blue in the face to live the Christian life, but sooner or later that mask comes off. And you'll, you'll quit the strayed because you do not have the Holy Spirit, but an unholy spirit. Now, a lot of people will blame the pastor. Oh, you don't think I'm saved. I'll, what do you want me to do? You want me to lie to you? I'm not calling any names. I'm just, I'm just preaching the word. If you feel convicted right now, you ought to make a call and election sure. I'm good to go to church. Right? Nice, happy message. Holy Spirit comforts the believer. John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So if things are going real well in your life. You got money in your pocket, and you know things are going good at work or business, whatever. But when trouble comes to your life, you're a different bird. You know, you're looking for professional counseling. Now forget the preacher at the church. Look for professional counsel. I want a professional. I want a professional counselor. Is it is a, a professional problem? You may talk about peace and comfort, but God has never really comforted you. You claim to be saved, but since your profession and the trials you have been through, God, the Holy Spirit, really comforted you. Is it supernatural? Maybe you're not sure. But I would challenge you by saving, and saying our church, could, could you not know when, uh, you, when the Spirit of God moved in your life? And John 14, 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. The Holy Spirit glorifies Christ. Christ is glorified in, uh, when we bear fruit in our lives. And this is done through surrender, yielding of the Holy Ghost, uh, to the Holy Ghost, allowing God to have his perfect will and complete will in your life. And, and this is what the Bible teaches. Let's go to John 16, please. And verse 13. And the Bible says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. In, in uh, his, For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall, he shall hear, shall he speak, and he will uh, show you all things to come. Notice John 15 and verse 26. And notice the Bible says, But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you uh, from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which uh, proceeded from the Father, he will testify in me. 
And then notice John 15, verse 8. John 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. The fruit of the, uh, is the result of the Spirit of God coming to your life. So think about this. God says fruit. So think about love. The, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 13, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Let's turn there, please. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. And notice the Bible says, verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So if a person is truly a convert of Christ, he's going to love people. He's going to love his enemies. He's, he's, he's not going to look for retaliation or to get back on him. He's not. So it's, it's so important we understand that. He's going to love the unlovable. So that's what the Bible teaches. And then we, we see that uh, love is, is deed and according to the truth, the, the word of God. And then if you truly have the spirit of God in you, you will not just go through the motions of saying that you love God, you love Jesus, you love the church, you love the brethren, you love the, the Bible, but you'll, you'll put action uh, to the love. And it will be done according to the scriptures, the word of God. So we can't just love in word, but rather according to truth and according to action. And that shows you whether a person truly saved or not. And these disciples in Acts 19 never heard the Holy Spirit. Nor was, it in, nor was he indwelling in their life. And if you look at John's message in the gospel, you find the that John the Baptist mentioned the Holy Ghost many times. And then third of all, we see what was it that these men were lacking uh, then. So the, the idea is that these men had made profession of faith. They prayed the sinner's prayer. They had a religious experience. Yet they lacked what Peter states in Acts 19.4. They had never repented. And when you come and never come to a place in life where they saw themselves lost and on the road to hell. Now I want you to look at verse 19, in chapter 19 rather, chapter 19, and look at what Paul says here in verse 4. Then said Paul, John very baptized with the baptism of repentance. So what is the baptism of repentance? It's simple. Repent and get baptized. That's exactly what it means. I used to live up and downstairs from a guy <laughs> who just wanted to argue with me. And he was a preacher. I was a, well, he wasn't a preacher. Anyway, he, he was in the ministry. And um, anyway, he came down and he always found me on a Sunday. It's late at night. I'm taking the garbage out. And he'd meet me in the hallway. I think sometimes he was sitting on the stairs just waiting for me to come out. Because, you know, I always brought the garbage out Sunday night. And he showed up one time and he said, he, uh, he always said, uh, he always asked me a question. What about the baptism of repentance? I said, what, what is it? I, said, I know, you tell me. He said, well, you should know. When you repent, you get baptized. It's not hard to figure out, pal. Did I say that? <laughs> I scratched my head and said, what's wrong with you? He wasn't saved, man. And uh, so the, the, the key was that he needed to repent. And, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of people, I just heard a preacher on, on YouTube uh, just recently say that most churches 
are filled with lost people. I don't believe that about our church, but we have lost people in our midst. And uh, they never repented. Uh, they had never come to a place in their lives when they saw themselves lost and on the road to hell. Then when, when did you come to the place uh, in your life? Some never humble themselves enough to repent. I have nothing to, in me that could help save me. I'm a hell-deserving sinner. I mean, I, I have nothing good in me. And as, as a result, you and I, like those certain disciples who never had a life-changing experience, uh, is found only in Jesus Christ. And maybe you're here this morning and irritated uh, at everything I've shown, showed you so far. Just maybe I haven't showed you anything, uh, anything apart from the truth of the Word of God. So what are, you, what are you agitated about? What's bothering you? So I think it's important to look at one more proof than our last point. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, alcohol will control you the place where you will change your, uh, your walk, change your talk, and change your life. Paul makes the comparison between alcohol and uh, change uh, for the worst. So the Spirit of God will change your walk, your talk, and your lifestyle if, you, if your life hasn't changed from before your profession, then you never got saved. And that's, that's the truth. And you may say, well, all I know is that I pray the sinner's prayer and uh, you know, I did my part. Yeah, God didn't do his. That's, that's really brilliant. God didn't do his. And just bring it up to him at, at the judgment seat. Lord, I repented and you didn't save me. That's going to go like a lead balloon. God always does his part. Amen. He said, I will no wise cast you out. When you come to Christ, God wants to save you. Amen. God is looking to save you. Amen. And he'll, he'll do his part. Now, how did the disciples, certain disciples, respond. This is so important. We'll close. Before we look at that, let's look at the warning God gives us in his word. In Genesis 6 and verse 3, and the Lord said, uh, at, uh, he said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. That's what God's word says. He's not, he, he's going to work, but he's not always going to Walk with 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 uh, the dealing with men's hearts. He's going to pull away. He's going to stop. Ephesians four thirty and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you sealed in the day of redemption. So you don't, you don't want to grieve the Spirit of God. You want to respond as God is speaking to you. Acts seven verse fifty one. You stiff necked and circumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did. So do ye. In Proverbs 29, 1, he that being often reproved, hard in his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. That, that is a very sobering verse. Because you think about people in our life. You've heard people go bankrupt, and they come right back. Heard people lost a job, they get another job. You hear people lose their job, they start a new business. People are always able to recover. But spiritually, God says, if you're being often reproved and you harden your neck, they'll suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. And I, I would tell you that verse makes me fear. I'm saved, that saved comes. I know my Bible, I walk with the Spirit, I walk, I try to walk in the power of the Spirit, I try to be led by the Spirit, I, I do all these things, and not just on Sunday, I try to do seven days a week. 
But when you see this, destruction and that without remedy. That's a sobering verse. Sobering verse. And then notice, if you would, Proverbs chapter 1. And uh, those verse 7. The Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So I'm pretty plain what the Bible says. Uh, the fear of the Lord uh, is the beginning of knowledge. So if a person doesn't fear God, he, he doesn't have the fear of the Lord, he's not going to have knowledge. He's going to see everything as temporal. He's not going to see the, the spiritual. And then he goes on and says, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then those verse 20, please, of chapter 1. And the Bible says, <clears throat> uh, wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets, she crieth in the chief place of the concourse, in the uh, opening of the gates in the city, she uttered the words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in that scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn ye at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I'll make known my words unto you. So he's telling them, Repentance and you'll receive the Spirit. That's what he says right here. Notice verse 23, uh, 20, uh, 34, uh, 24, I'm sorry. Because I've called and you refuse, I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but you have set at naught all my counsel and with none of my reproof, I'll also laugh at your calamity. I'll mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh in desolation, and your destruction cometh in the whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall you call upon me. But I'll not answer. They shall seek my, me, me, me early, but uh, not, uh, and, and they and shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So, beloved, I want to say this. So, I, I'm really bothered that God would laugh at me. Well, you just indicted yourself. You just, you just said, I'm not going to respond to God. And I don't, I, don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a problem with God laughing at you. If God wants to laugh at me, look, there's plenty of evidence. But I'm saying that, you know, what arrogance on your part. What, what thoughtful, thoughtlessness on your part to think that God will laugh at me and you're going to be bothered by that? Let me ask you another question. Have you been obedient to Christ? Have you done his will for your life? Have, have you feared him? No, I, I don't fear God. Well, he's going to laugh at your calamity. And your calamity's coming. It's not if if you win. And that's a sobering thought. A sobering thought. Again, the importance of the fear of God. It's the beginning of knowledge. And if I were you as a parent, I would teach my children to fear God. If I, I, if I were you, I would fear God. And it's so important that we learn that in our lives. We don't want God laughing at us. I'd rather hear, well done, that good and faithful servant, than the, the, the eternal God laughing at us. So, the problem with the, the, the certain disciples is they all submitted to salvation. And I, if I were you as a parent, message. I would teach my children and, uh, fear God. In chapter 19, Five. the 12 disciples became real disciples. 
of Christ. And the key is this, is they simply got honest with themselves. They, they uh, looked at what they were, sinners, in need of salvation, and find them repenting and believing the gospel. And they became real disciples of Christ. Now, I have to tell you that it's so important that you get honest with yourself. Some of you are in la-la land spiritually. You have your own religion and uh, do your own thing. Come here, you yes me. Yes, that's right, preacher, and so on and so forth. But you're living a different life. It's a religious life, not a spiritual life. It's so important you come clean and come to Christ before it's too late. Now, I say this, but I mean, the Bible tells us over and over again, in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And you want to be ready. You don't want to be left behind. All right? Let's stand on our feet and... Uh, Father, thank you so much for this time. We thank you, Lord, for uh, the teaching from the Word of God. And Father, we pray that you bless this invitation. I pray people come and uh, be saved. I pray, Father, that uh, the saints will come and repent. And I pray, Father, these things in our Lord's precious name.